Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And <clears throat> I'll speak today based on the Bhagavad Gita on the topic of how the Bhagavad Gita's knowledge can help us to change ourselves for the better. Yoga as a means for self transformation. So I <coughs> talk this based in I'll talk this in four broad parts. So the first three parts we'll be talking about why changing ourselves is difficult. Now changing ourselves may be maybe we tend to be short tempered, we tend to have certain weaknesses. So why changing ourselves is so difficult? That will be the first three parts and the last part will be how Krishna can help us to change ourselves. So broadly the four topics I will be talking is to <coughs> understand the nature of the world. Second is to understand the nature, <coughs> the nature of uh, the solutions that we seek. The third is the nature of the mind and the last will be the nature of Krishna. <clears throat> so I was uh, at a I was in America in Connecticut at a seminar on at a conference on spirituality and addiction and addiction is one of the problems that has just expanded itself to an alarming level in the last few decades people would always abuse some substances, people would, intoxication has been there almost throughout recorded human history. But whether it's alcohol, it's drugs, it's tobacco, there's so many substances, the sheer number of people who get addicted is horrifying. And on an average, substance abuse is just one kind of addiction where people take some substances. Now there is also behavioral abuse where sometimes people get addicted to certain devices they addicted to certain actions so <clears throat> when I read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time about 25 years ago this was a verse which spoke out to me in the Gita where in 3.36 Arjuna asks Krishna Athakena prayuktoyam papam charati purushaha anichana pivarshneya Baladivani Ojitaha. Oh, Krishna, what is it that makes us act against our own best interests, even if we don't want to? Even if we know that this is not good, even if we don't want to do it. So, when I read that, I felt that this is an eminently relevant question. And that's what reading that was triggered my interest in the Gita. Otherwise, since my child, in my childhood basically, I had memorized some Gita verses as a part of a Gita recitation contest. And I knew a little bit about the Gita, but it was nothing, I had never seen it as relevant. But this verse is a, it's a universal problem, where people end up uh, destroying themselves. Now there can be a very drastic and sudden destruction when somebody commits suicide. But there can be slow self-destruction through <coughs> addictions or even sometimes people are just short-tempered. I had at that time a strong anger issue. That's what interested me. What is it that makes me angry like that? So <coughs> that may, by that we may sabotage our relationships at a slower level. But that's what we end up doing. So now often people think that if somebody is addicted to some substance, that person just lacks willpower. He just, you don't have, you know, why do you drink? Why do you smoke? Why do you take drugs? Just stop it. So, it's, yes, willpower is definitely required, but much more is going on over there. <clears throat> so, let's start with first, whenever a person does some behavior which is unhealthy, what is it that impels them to do it? It is usually some kind of discomfort. The first poem I was talking about is that nature of the world. So each of these points, these four points that I'll take, 
after each point i'll stop a little bit and if any point that struck you you can reflect that and you can share that point with you know something which you would like to carry home to share with others so nature of the world is the first point i'm discussing and in general life makes us uncomfortable sooner or later so that discomfort may be in the form of just stress overwork loneliness anxiety anger misunderstanding like in many different ways like this in which we start feeling uncomfortable and whenever we feel uncomfortable an instinctive reaction is that we try to shift to a more comfortable we try to get more comfort say if right now you are sitting and we find that okay maybe yeah, it's a little uncomfortable your legs can't stretch properly or legs are too cramped then you try to move to a place where you can be more comfortable so we instinctively even without thinking whenever a uncomfortable situation comes up we try to move towards something comfortable and that's natural say if right now if i'm sitting here and suppose we were in open air and this bar was very cold so if i touched it once and i found it cold then throughout the class i will keep my hand like this i wouldn't have pressed it on the ground that's because it's cold so now at one level this is a just a common sense response of the body where we avoid discomfort because that's what is suitable for our survival and for our health but often we face situations where sometimes in avoiding discomfort we move towards unhealthy responses so um, uh, for example if somebody is hooked say to surfing on the net or just watching movies watching sports reading news some people can just get hooked to that and spend hours and hours on that or like i always said somebody takes drugs or somebody takes alcohol now usually what happens is that they feel uncomfortable because of something maybe somebody speaks harshly to them or some plan which they had worked very hard suddenly goes completely bust and then when they feel that discomfort they try to retreat from that discomfort and if they have done a particular behavior repeatedly So if somebody's reflex response to discomfort is just let's start surfing on the net, let's start watching a movie, then even without thinking they start doing that. And sometimes some learned some some responses like this, some responses which we seek for getting away from discomfort may be little harmful. Some may be very harmful. If somebody takes drugs. that can be disastrous so now it's not just a matter of will power no i will not take drugs yes its will power is required but at that time the discomfort is what they need to deal with and if they don't learn to deal with the discomfort in a healthier way then that discomfort as soon as it comes no matter what resolution they may have made even without thinking they will be pushed towards the behavior again towards that particular substance again so now <coughs> what makes the situation especially troublesome is that life never stops making us uncomfortable today one discomfort may come it may go away after some time but tomorrow another discomfort will come after that another discomfort will come so this discomforts keep coming and when discomforts keep coming now historically also in the past people would take alcohol and things like that but the scale of addiction today is much greater and there can be many reasons for this but one major reason is that in the past people had a greater capacity to be comfortable with feeling uncomfortable Com be comfortable with feeling uncomfortable that me means that okay this discomfort is there let me just tolerate it but now 
we have our capacity to live with discomfort has gone down significantly and that again has many reasons but one major reason is that the media and the culture portrays as if everything is meant to be wonderful in life as if discomfort is unnatural it is discomfort is never desirable discomfort is undesirable but it is not unnatural the nature of the world is that discomfort will come whatever uh, be the specific cause of the discomfort that may vary from person to person but everybody gets uncomfortable sooner or later so the less we are capacity to tolerate discomfort then the greater is our tendency to go towards our default reaction so many times when people succumb to some unwanted habit say somebody is short tempered and just get angry some people they get angry and then they decide i'm never going to get angry again mm -hmm. and then again they start getting angry and then the other person reminds them you are getting angry i am not getting angry <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> they when they get they resolve not to get angry they get angry with themselves for having gotten angry so we just get lost now it's not it's not just lacking will power over there what has happened is maybe the other person did something which annoyed them and now how to deal with that annoyance in a more constructive way if that the person doesn't know then what happens automatically the angry reaction comes up the anger comes up so the to be able to understand why we are not able to change ourselves why we gravitate towards behaviors which we do not want to do one feature one thing to understand is that in this world discomfort is natural not this not desirable but natural and when we are feeling some discomfort it is not a catastrophe it is discomfort maybe say there is some strain in our relationships discomfort maybe we feel some physical pain discomfort maybe that the weather is not good discomfort maybe in various kinds broadly ev adhyatmik adi bhautik adi daivik from the body mind from the relationships and from the <coughs> world around us so <coughs> when this kind of discomforts come up at that time if we understand this is not unnatural then we won't rush gravitate towards it so first is we learn to we learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable that is like say if somebody goes to a gym for a workout now if we try to lift weights which are which are heavy we we feel uncomfortable now if somebody says i don't want to feel uncomfortable and somebody goes to the gym and lifts weights that cause no exercise at all then that will not lead to much development of the muscles now of course if somebody can lift say 10 kg weights and they lift 57 kg 50 60 kg weights they might get crushed so there is also limit to how much discomfort we can tolerate but in general growth happens when we accept discomfort so that is if we want to change ourselves we look at what are the situations when we become uncomfortable and okay this is not a terrible thing the solution part i'll come in the last section but this was the first point that for all of us when we think i will not do this behavior i will not overeat i will not oversleep i will not uh, yell at others i will not do this i will not do that we are not just trying to fight that behavior itself is like trying to cut the weeds but understanding what is causing us discomfort when we address that when you find a healthier way to address discomfort that is when we are taking out the roots otherwise we may just cut off the weeds but next time the season or rainy season comes or the appropriate season comes the weeds will come again so by raw will power we may suppress that behavior but it will not sustain itself for long so the nature of the world is that it makes us uncomfortable and we need to become comfortable with being uncomfortable
So that was the first point. Any reflections or thoughts on this? Anything that struck you? Anything that you, uh, after this class, if you want to share with someone, what you would like to share? Yeah. There is that uh, nature of uh, being comfortable with comfortable itself equals willpower. You know, it doesn't come naturally itself, right? Like, you know? So how do we actually, like, as you mentioned, we need to go to the root of the problem. So, you know, even though we know that willpower alone cannot solve the problem, but uh, we even get adjusted to that situation, like, you know, that level. Okay. So how do we actually do that? So this is not a reflection, it is a question, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> I'll just answer very briefly. See, willpower is required for doing anything in life. But, the willpower required to tolerate discomfort is actually far lesser than the willpower required to restrain that behavior. So it's like a lever. If you have to lift 10 kg weight yourself, it will require some effort. But if you have a lever, you just apply some pressure on it, it becomes much easier. So we have to apply pressure, we have to apply force. So we have to, that how to tolerate that? Often it is, I'll talk about the last section about spiritual growth. That's how we can do it. But yes, that also it's a valid point that that also requires some willpower. But it is, uh, yeah, it is much easier. It's like say suppose somebody has got cough and they feel like coughing and they say by willpower I will not cough. Uh, I will not cough. That's going to be impossible to. Do. Now on the other hand, if if say they they like to take cold cold water or cold drinks or ice cream and they love it. Now to stop that, taking that is also going to require willpower. But the willpower required to stop taking ice cream is actually much more manageable than the willpower required to stop coughing. <laughs> Isn't it? So everything requires willpower, but there are some areas where it's more effective and somewhere it is just not effective. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. I was just going to comment. You notice in life very often that if people accept some discomfort, they go to the gym or whatever it is they do, then it helps them overcome a certain other discomfort. Yes, excellent point. Thank you. Now if we learn to accept one discomfort, you could say our capacity to tolerate discomfort increases and that helps us in other walks of life also. So it's not just that area, but we, we saw our capacity to tolerate discomfort becomes like a shield around us. And that shield helps us in various walks of life. Yes, thank you. So, we'll move on to the second point and I will not move from that up from the second to third point till you reflect some things. So think of what you are going to reflect. <laughs> so, the second point was what? Does anyone remember? We are talking about how we can change our behaviors. So, change the, the nature of the solutions that we seek. Now, nature of the solutions means that sometimes we may feel that suppose somebody is say an alcoholic and you just give up alcohol, why do you drink it? So yes, we may feel like that but we may feel that giving up alcohol is very easy because there is no attachment to it within us. So the nature of every sense object in this world, every object that allures us is that it has its own gravity pull just like say if I pick up this phone and drop it now, don't worry whoever it is I'm not going to drop it <laughs> but if I drop it it's going to fall because there's a gravity pull which will pull it now interestingly enough this gravity pull of the earth is the same for all objects of similar weight now, if my phone is of the same weight, your phone is the same weight, then pull down by the same force itself. However, with respect to the sense objects, the sense objects gravity pull on our consciousness is different for different people. So the sense object may be the same, but the pull that it exerts on a particular person may be, will, can be very different from the pull it exerts on another person. Say a simple example is that if somebody is in India or Australia, cricket is a 
very attractive game for people. People are hooked into it. So any cricket news, they are very eager. If here in India or Australia we hear about say some ice hockey tournament, okay, who bothers? We will not even notice it, isn't it? Now if you go to Canada, ice hockey is big over there. And people forget everything when it comes to ice hockey. So what happens is for Canadians, the gravity pull of ice hockey is huge. And if you go to Canada and you talk about cricket, they think it's an insect. <laughs> so the game of cricket may hardly have any gravity pull on them. So now, now understanding this is very important for us to become empathic towards those who have unwanted behaviors. So if somebody is an addict of something, then why do you keep drinking like this? Why do you keep doing like this? Actually speaking, we don't feel that gravity pull. And that's why it will work. Just give it up. But they feel that gravity pull, and it's forceful for them. And it's so strong that they just can't resist it. So the sense objects exert variable gravity pulls on different people. Now, <clears throat> when the gravity pull comes, it's unless say, this phone is being held by someone, it will automatically go down. But similarly, for people, they just automatically gravitate towards the particular objects they have indulged in. Now, what determines uh, how much gravity pull a particular thing will have on a particular person? What do you think? What determines that? Just from the earlier example of cricket and ice hockey. The background. Like the background. The habit. The environment. The habit, the All of you are right. It's more specific. It's kind of mixed with person's likes and dislikes. The person's likes and dislikes. Nature. Nature. Habit is came the closest till now, but a little bit more specific than habit. Attachment. Attachment, Attachment itself is the gravity pull actually. The satisfaction that they derive from that. Satisfaction that they derive from action. that. Involved. Action. Can you elaborate that action? Yeah, yeah. Little bit more. When you get involved in something, you develop a habit to do that. Yes. Thing. So it's just their repeated indulgence in that. Yeah. How much a person has engaged in it in the past and how much a person has enjoyed that indulgence in the past. So that determines how much a person will be attracted by it. Like somebody who's never played ice hockey, never watched ice hockey, there is no kept attraction towards that. But somebody has watched many, many cricket matches, then when the cricket match comes up, immediately there is a pull. So the gravity pull of particular sense objects is determined by how much a particular person has indulged in it. And this is where we often are caught unawares. That when we do a particular activity. We think this is just one time. What is the big deal? Just once I am going to do it. But what happens is, what we don't understand is, each time we do it, we are increasing that object's gravity pull on us. With respect to alcohol, it is said that first, the drink, the drinker takes the drink. Then, the drink takes the drink. And then, the drink takes the drinker. <coughs> so, it just pulled forcefully so this so the nature of the worldly objects is that the more we indulge in them the greater is the gravity pull they exert on us so that's why a person who has repeatedly indulged in something they are more and more prone to indulging in it um, if we consider some unwanted habits if you consider say on a scale, say drugs or smoking or drinking. Drugs, most people, it's very bad, don't do it. Smoking, okay, at least don't do it in public. You know, you burn, don't burn me. Isn't it? Uh, private, you can only have to do it in so many places, so don't smoke. And now drinking, people think, it's, especially in the Western culture, it's just a part of life. They say drink, but don't become drunk. That is their idea. Drink in moderation. Now, it may be possible for some people to do it, but it is very dangerous. Because what happens, that when they keep drinking, 
they get some high by it they get some pleasure by it and then they may i uh, may drink a uh, thousand times and never become a drunk in the sense of excessively drunk but sometime if these two things come together they are feeling some discomfort they want some relief and at that time drink is available to them so they may just get pulled and they may get pulled completely by it so therefore uh, <clears throat> before we come into the gravity pull of something we need to be aware of how powerful its pull can be for somebody who becomes an addict that object of their addiction becomes almost like a black hole what is the characteristic of a black hole yes yad gatva na nivartanti what goes inside doesn't come out <laughs> when the rays of light get pulled into it even they can't come out so like that its gravity pull is so high so for those who have repeatedly indulged in something the gravity pull becomes so great they just can't resist it mm. nowadays many people have what is internet addiction screen addiction different kinds so i saw one poster i was at this uh, is addiction spirituality seminar so they showed that how a person is working on a computer and they are not just like working i think some surfing and the computer that person turns away and like tentacles come out from the computer mm -hmm. tentacles come out and the person trying to look away uh, pulled back <laughs> pulled back towards that object so that's how <coughs> the pull is exerted so when we understand this then also we understand why sometimes we relapse sometimes we feel i have no desire at all you know, i will never do this again so, but next moment or a few moments later zoop not only do we get the desire to do it we also end up doing it why because say in the earlier time one moment before we may not have been in the gravity pull of that but the next moment we come in the gravity pull so we get pulled down so like right now i am sitting the chair is under me so i am comfortable but suppose while i am sitting maybe i get up for a moment and then somebody pulls the chair away from me and then i sit down and i won't sit down i just fall down why because the chair has been there so often when we have some other support we have something else which wards off that gravity pull say if we are <coughs> very busy and absorbed in doing something then that fills our consciousness then we don't feel pulled towards it hmm? say if somebody has a habit also of surfing a lot on the net but if they have some urgent Uh, deadline driven project they have to do then even if some notification comes up just forget it not now later so that time they'll be able to resist it but as soon as that work gets off then there is nothing else to push them away then immediately they get pulled see one simple way to understand what has a powerful gravity pull on us is to look at what we think of when we have nothing to think of where do our thoughts go to when we are idle that will indicate which objects exert a powerful gravity pull on us so that is the second point that different objects they all exert their gravity pull on us and depending on how much we have indulged in them that much greater becomes their gravity pull and because of that gravity pull it is often difficult to resist it So, any reflections about this? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I'm not sure if the reflection might be a question or also. Um, in our context, um, there could be things because of, uh, uh, <coughs> as you were mentioning, something that you indulged in the past for, for a long time. So, there could be a thing where uh, before coming to Krishna, <coughs> you were into whatever that Anatta was. warm water okay. and uh, <coughs> yeah and then, and then after that you, you are trying to resist that and at all but because you have, as you were mentioning earlier done it like a thousand times it's already so powerful that uh, you know it just uh, pulls you back in hmm. uh, and you have you seem to have absolutely no control 
or were they? So, um, in, in, so because because you did all of that before, you realized things. Okay, that's true. So in that case, how, how, what is the correction? Okay, yeah. So again, this is a big question. It's a question rather than a comment, and I'll answer it later in the last part. But briefly, I'll say that first thing is be kind to yourself. Be kind and understanding with yourself. Not understanding in the sense of just licensing us and this is the way I am and this is the way I want to stay. But do, don't need to beat ourselves down if we are pulled down. We understand we are pulled down because of that gravity pull. And <clears throat> in general, if we can find something else that pulls us in another direction, that engages us, that absorbs us, then we can minimize the pull. But that pull will be there. And then if somebody has that pull, they have to be more cautious. So if somebody is a, is an alcoholic, then in the, even that person, uh, <coughs> I was actually at an interfaith meeting and in their representatives of Christianity, Islam and all other religions. So naturally they were serving drinks also over there. The other religious, even priests take drinks. But there was this Christian, I think a Methodist, he, he was not even touching it. In fact, he walked a long distance away from it. I was just talking with him. He said that actually I was alcoholic. And when I was down in the dumps because of the alcohol, that's when I turned towards God. Rescued. So now I absolutely don't go near it. So he, 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 everybody else may take it, but he doesn't take it. So if we are particularly vulnerable to something, then we have to be especially cautious about it. We can't be averse to it. We can't condemn others doing it if they, if, because we, we don't control others. But if we have certain vulnerabilities, then we have to be cautious about it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for troubling you. That's good. Thank you. Any other reflection about this gravity pull? Yes, please. Uh, which well I wouldn't go to that extreme by saying that, that so we think of some things which make our character I would say that often makes the lower extreme of our character you know, it, it is a part of us but that is not necessarily us what we say do in private or what we do when we are idle or what we do that we hide from others that is a part of us but I wouldn't say that that is the that is the real us. That is a part of us, and sometimes that can be serious. That has to be dealt with, and it will affect our character also. But it will affect one part of us. If that is what starts consuming our whole life, then it becomes much more of a serious problem. But otherwise, it is a, it is a part of us, and it is a problematic part of us. Thank you. Yes. Um, different different circumstances. Can pose a different gravity in a in a daily basis as well for a different people. Uh, for example, having the alcohol, they are indulgent with the alcohol, but for the next day they may not enjoy the alcohol. They may enjoy a gambling. So, isn't that the circumstances can also make difference in a? In a yes, of course. So, circumstances affect definitely. It's a. It's, so, as I said, the, how we have indulged in the past is one factor. But that's only one factor. Just like say, somebody from here, if they go to Canada and they start living among Canadians, maybe after six months, they will also be mad about ice hockey. Because so our association does affect us. So, the gravity pull, so, uh, the gravity pull of objects is determined not just by the objects themselves, but also by the association of people around us. One way I put it is that our desires are not just linear, they are also triangular. That means it's not just that we see an object and we desire to enjoy it. It's also if we see that object and we see somebody else enjoying that object. Hey, what's there? Let me find out. So many people, they themselves may never drink, but they are social drinkers. And other people, everybody is drinking, I don't want to be the odd person now, so they drink. 
but next day they are with people who are gambling then they become social gamblers so it's, <laughs> so it's basically like the, the association also does affect us a lot the kind of people we are in kind of situation we are in that also affects us but when the desire or the when the behavior is situational it's not so much of a, you could say a, a irresistible gravity pull and a situational pull is there and we may not resist it but that may not be irresistible so if tomorrow if that same it's not that every time we go in that situation we may gamble somebody you say goes to las vegas once they say oh las vegas i want to know what it is i want to go they may go and gamble but they i was in las vegas i did some programs there so they said that actually it's uh, gambling is so dangerous and everybody knows that it's so dangerous that the residents of las vegas have among the least gambling rates in america <laughs> so they invite all americans or all people from the world to gamble but they themselves don't gamble so much <laughs> so they make all arrangements in fact it's paradoxical that they say las vegas is one of the for people staying there it's a very safe city but for people visiting there it is not very safe <laughs> they will lose everything over there so you know it's if they are not tempted by that if they are not indulging in that repeatedly even being in a situation also may not pull them situation is one factor but it's our indulgence that makes the gravity pull stronger and stronger okay thank you so okay is this question or comments is question or comment okay Yeah, why do some people get into indulgence, some don't? I feel one major reason is uh, that person doesn't have a, the person who indulges is a person who doesn't have a healthy way to deal with discomfort. So the factor one. So if the other person has the healthy way to deal with discomfort, then they will not gravitate towards it. Okay. Yes. That's a good point. Sometimes when we are extremely happy, or sometimes we are extremely unhappy. Yes. Uh, what happens is when we are when in extreme emotion, then we put aside our reason, and and at that time we might just lower our guards completely. One of the lessons from the Ramayana, I have written a book on the Ramayana. Uh, so one of the lessons is that Dashrath Maharaj. he promises kai kai three times whatever you want i'll give you in the name of ram whatever you want i'll give you now ram is my life and in the name of my life i will give you whatever you want and he makes this promise because he's so happy that ram is going to become the prince regent and the king so he said when you are extremely happy you can give gifts but don't give promises <laughs> <laughs> so because gift is a one time one time interaction but a promise can be held against us life long in good point. thank you you had some comment okay. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes we go towards that which is easily available. Yes, that is definitely true, because uh, it's not that we are entirely like programmed machines. 
So we do have free will and uh, sometimes uh, if something, some particular pleasure is more easily available than the other, then we might choose that. So say somebody likes to just surf on the net, but if there is no net over there, then they might just surf on their computer only. I find some movie, I find some novel, I find this, I find that and they try to read that itself. So, or they might look at their own physical library and read something over there or take a physical cassette and watch it on there, whatever. So there are different ways one might do based on what, one is, what is available. So the principle there is uh, that basically if we do something repeatedly, it pulls us more and more. But if the situation is not providing that facility, then two things may happen. So we, may, we might just find some other way to escape the discomfort or we might just do anything and everything to get over that situation. It depends on how strong, how strongly we are pulled towards it. Okay. Thank you. So let's move to the third point now. The first point was that the world keeps making us uncomfortable and if we don't process the discomfort properly, we go towards illusion. Second point was that if we indulge in a particular activity or object, it starts pulling us more and more. The third is, so the nature of the nature of the world, the nature of the sense objects, and third is the nature of the mind. Now we may say the attachment is in the mind itself. So is it that the object that is pulling us or is the mind rushing towards it? See, it's both ways. But here I am talking about the mind, I am talking about something else specifically. The mind can have many different aspects to how it behaves but the mind often acts like an inner discourager the mind discourages us what does it mean that suppose say we are resolved okay i'm not going to do this and then as soon as we make the resolution only the mind starts saying you are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be able to do it. And then eventually when we succumb, I say, see, I told you, you are not going to be able to do it. I proved right. And next time, don't even try it. So the mind is constantly speaking. And the mind is internally discouraging us repeatedly. So the nature of the mind <clears throat> is to interpret failure negatively. Failure is an event. But to interpret failure negatively means to think that failure is not just an event, it is our perpetual condition. This is how you are and this is how you are going to be. So because the mind keeps discouraging us, therefore we often lose heart. We just lose our desire, lose our will, lose our uh, spirits. And this inner discourager, it actually gets justification. It gets justification firstly I'll talk about this in three different ways. First is that with respect to discomfort. When the discomfort comes, the mind says, hey, this should not be happening to you. You should not be feeling like this. This is so unpleasant. So the mind often makes the discomfort seem far bigger than what it is. So suppose sometimes see, one, one discomfort I forgot to mention is just boredom. Most people get bored. In fact, there was a survey done of young healthy people, healthy, reasonably wealthy, healthy, reasonably wealthy people in the best developed world. They found 5% of the time people are happy, 5% of the time people are unhappy and 90% people are bored. <laughs> So most of the entertainment industry is actually a boredom industry, it's an anti-boredom industry you could say. 
because people are bored so they desperately seek entertainment now boredom is not pleasant but boredom is not a disaster okay i'm feeling bored but the mind a mind exaggerates the pain of the discomfort this is so terrible boredom will come it will stay for some time it will go away in its own course but now you have to do something about it so the first way the mind deludes us is it makes a discomfort seem bigger than what it is so it's a, it's like say sometimes the weather is bad sometimes it's very hot sometimes it's very cold now it is with climate change happening recently somebody sent me a message that that in the same day when chicago had the lowest temperature in world hist- in recorded history minus 47 degrees celsius at that time somewhere in australia there was 47 degrees celsius <laughs> <laughs> so extremes so now sometimes the weather is very hot it's a inconvenience but some people they just keep complaining it's so hot today it's so hot today it's so hot today and it's like a broken audio player it just keeps playing the same track again and again and again and again some broken audio players stop but some broken audio players you can't stop them only they just keep playing keep playing so some people are like that they just keep repeating oh, it's so hot it's so hot it's so hot now after if suppose we have to live with them or work with them after some times the heat is not as big a problem as this person is complaining about the heat <laughs> so our mind is a chronic complainer and when discomfort is there the mind actually just keeps complaining about the discomfort so much that because of the mind is complaining the discomfort appears unbearable the discomfort itself is okay it's it's not pleasant again but it's okay manageable tolerable but the mind by its chronic complaining makes the bearable seem unbearable that's how the mind pushes us uh, towards some unhealthy response amidst discomfort that's one way the mind deludes us the second way the mind deludes us is by making the escape way seem very easy so why do you have to bear this when you can do this why do you have to be stay bored when you can just surf on the net why do you have to feel lonely when when you can just uh, watch some movies and get watch this and watch that and get some entertainment get some whatever so the mind makes you, say, you know, first of all this is unbearable and why do you have to do this when this is so easily available so the mind actually has a very selective memory krishna says in the bhagavad gita that sensual pleasures how do they taste in the beginning and how do they taste in the end does anyone remember sweet. sweet in the beginning poisonous. yeah bitter or poisonous in the end in 18.38 he says vishayendriya sanyogad yat tad agre amrutopamam pariname vishamiva tat sukham raj samsmutam it the contact of the senses and the sense objects they give some pleasure but that is delicious in the beginning but it is horrible in the end it's like somebody drinks when they drink they go high and they feel so good about it but after that they make a fool of themselves and then they get a hangover and hangover can be very painful it can be like a splitting headache people feel so now next time when the opportunity drink comes the mind remembers only the high not the hangover so because of selective memory the mind makes this is so uncomfortable and this is so easy so the mind depicts reality selectively so in that way it pushes us towards the unwanted behavior and thirdly as i said what i said in the beginning is that the mind discourages us when we try to change ourselves you will never be able to do it you will never be able to do it and that's how so now when this sort of portrayal starts coming either oh this is so uncomfortable this is so enjoyable this is so easily enjoyable and changing yourself is so difficult 
when we start we start feeling like this we need to identify this is the mind speaking so rather than getting discouraged by it we identify this is the mind speaking so as soon as suppose if we make a resolution and then if we, i will not be able to keep this when that thought comes in our mind one easy way to deal with it is that attribute every thought to the mind first means i won't be able to do it just before that put the mind is saying the mind is saying i won't be able to do it now sometimes it may be true also if somebody tells a lift up 50 kg suitcase well and say i won't be able to do it it's true but if somebody said lift up 10 kg weight i can't lift it that is not true so when we attribute something to the mind it doesn't mean that we reject it but rather we process it we evaluate it so whenever any such thought comes in hey this is so unbearable the mind is saying this is so unbearable as soon as we just do this what happens is we evaluate it this is so easily enjoyable the mind is saying this is so easily enjoyable then we will evaluate it so this is a habit that we need to cultivate and sometimes even in our normal course of action we can do this say when we do our japa at that time the mind wanders here there and everywhere and sometimes we feel this japa is simply a waste of time i am not able to fix my mind on krishna yes we are not able to fix the mind on krishna but even at that time we become aware that there is this mind thing inside me and this mind is distracting me so awareness of the mind is also a step forward in self realization so even if we don't become conscious of krishna if we become conscious of the mind also then also we are making spiritual advancement that means what that when the mind starts wandering instead of wandering with the mind just okay the mind wandered over there huh? just get it back and even if it goes back in the next moment but still actually the japa time is a very good time to at least learn to attribute our distractions to the mind and if we do that then that will be able to do it at other times also so the nature of the mind is to make change more difficult for us it by making the discomfort seem unbearable by seeing the making the escape way seem very easy and by making us seem incompetent or willless so by that way the mind makes change very difficult so this was the third point the nature of the mind any reflections on this Yes, definitely. The mind is uh, affected by what we have done in the past, which includes this life as well as the previous life. So, broadly speaking, to combine the points which we are all discussing, how we behave, it is determined by our past karma, by our upbringing, by our association, by our free will, and by Krishna's grace. It's five factors. By past karma itself, some people, uh, they, some children also. Even if you deal with children, you know, different ch each child is different. All children cry, but some children cry in a way they will bring the whole house down. <laughs> some children cry and they need attention, but it's not that uh, that uh, tumultuous. Hmm? So each child is different. So that's that's why the past karma. So our past karma, our upbringing. Say if somebody grew up in a house where the only way they saw problems being resolved was people yelling at each other. <laughs> Then when they grow up also, they think the only way to solve the problems is by yelling at each other. But if somebody grew up in a house 
where you know people never yelled at each other in public they may fight but say the parents always kept their fights away from the children parents were always cultured and respectful the children also grow up then okay you know this is this is not the way to behave in public so this is not so what happens our behavior is shaped by our past life's karma uh, not just our behavior our tendency to behave in particular ways also so all these three our past life karma are our bringing our association all of them pushes in particular directions and uh, uh, still we have free will by which we can counter push and then last point is krishna's grace that i'll be talking on the fourth point any other comments yes please so i read your article on uh, where you compare the mind to inbox and how different thoughts break down into mind and then uh, like inbox the emails are not important they go into our junk mailbox which we never check so i just do it because it's each and every thought but problem is to me i don't know which one is a junk email and which one is important yeah okay so if we treat our mind like a inbox where many mails are coming in so we need to put the junk mails in the junk bo- uh, in the junk folder but how do we know whether it is a junk yes mm, that's why i said that it's good to attribute whatever comes in our consciousness to the mind first then that will eval that will inspire us to evaluate it so some amount of intelligence is required to evaluate and gradually as our intelligence becomes sharper and sharper then we do it do that kind of junking faster and faster say suppose we are passing by a bar and maybe in the past we might have gone to the bar before we practicing bhakti or whatever and then some people when they pass by a bar they actually look back you know keep looking over there maybe i can go inside but now if you understand that okay i don't want to look in that direction so even if we look in that direction don't look we look a little bit and we look away we look straight ahead after some time we not even look in that direction so over a period of time what certain things we are able to junk more easily but what happens is that just like uh, if you consider certain artificial certain uh, intelligent learning modules say if we if we <coughs> click a link once on say google then that like if you are surfing some site and there's a google ad which comes up you click on one google ad then on all other sites you will see that or similar ads coming up so like that what happens anything which we open up that keeps coming more and more but something which you don't open then gradually it starts going to the junk faster and faster actually we do at a conscious subconscious level also junk many thoughts because at, at the same time so many thoughts are coming in say right now i am speaking someone else is also speaking now if that is your child or that is your friend then uh, you may be interested but otherwise although that sound is coming in you don't focus on that so what are we doing it is coming in but we are putting it aside so we actually are good at processing and focusing and we don't consciously junk other things when we focus on one thing the other things automatically go into junk and we do that but we can do it more conscientiously also okay thank you hey krishna so okay yes sunday sometimes you know we uh, we are engaged in a such activity which is a waste of time but that time we think that this is a very important thing and uh, you know it's not a waste of time it's a very important thing hmm. but later on we realize that it was a very extremely waste of time so you know how to train the mind to uh, differentiate in such activity that no just this is a waste of time okay, okay. yeah good question so if some activity is seem to be like a waste of time are a waste of time but at that time we feel it's very urgent and very important also then how do we train ourselves we learn by experience that means that time we might just spend a lot of time on it but afterwards hey that was a waste of time so next time we are a little more cautious say if we drive on an unfamiliar road and we drive fast and suddenly there's a pothole we get jolted that time we just didn't know better 
But next time when we go along that road, we are a little more cautious. So similarly, if we look back and see that was the time when I wasted my time. So then it's a little, we can become more alert about it. So in general, one principle is that the greater the structure we have for our life, the lesser the rupture the mind will cause in our life. I'll repeat this. The greater the structure we have in our life, the lesser the rupture the mind will be able to cause in our life. The structure means, say, if I wake up in the morning and it's a working day for me. So even if I turn on my phone and I start reading, it, start reading this, browsing this, browsing that, okay, in an hour I have to go to work. Because that structure is there for me, I will not waste unlimited amount of time. Of course, it never is unlimited, but huge amount of time. But suppose it's an off day for me. You know, I have nothing binding to do. Then what happens? I wake up and start browsing. And then I keep browsing and keep browsing and keep browsing. May spend 8-10 hours on it. Maybe one link and another link and another link and it just goes on and on. So in general, if we create structures in our life, those structures will ensure that we don't get too distracted. So we cannot we don't want our life life to be like completely rigidly structured it depends on how our nature is some people like it very structured some people like it uh, less structured but some structure is required there was a there's a famous author he um, he also he is actually a school teacher and he became a famous author and after he became an author he still continued as a teacher and then when once the interview was being done, so they asked him, see, you, are, you write such great books. You are a world famous author. Why are you still working as a teacher? Won't you have more time if you don't work as a teacher? So he replied that if I don't work as a teacher, I'll have no time for writing. It's, it's paradoxical, it's ironic. But what he meant is that in writing, I, this is also my experience, that uh, when you have finite time for writing, I know, okay, today evening I have to go for a program. So I have one hour, two hours to write right now. Then I will use that time to write. But if I know next whole week I have no programs. So next whole week I have available for writing. Then maybe I'll read this, maybe I'll do research for this. Maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. And at the end of the whole week I'll find I have written nothing. So the writing requires some amount of creativity and inspiration. But still, there also some structure is needed. So often we feel that, oh, when I have enough peace of mind, enough free time, then I will focus on chanting. Then I will focus on studying scripture. Yes, if we get it, it's good. But sometimes when we get that, we may not do anything also. So the point I'm making here is that we try to create some structures by which even if we get diverted, we won't get diverted for too long. Another thing is that if we are not sure whether something is valuable or not, like suppose somebody sometimes somebody sends us a video on YouTube or on WhatsApp or whatever. Now it's one or two minutes, we might just watch it immediately. But if it's 25-30 minutes, then we might just decide to put it instead of yes or no, we just put it later. And then if it is if it's truly important, we'll remember. Let me look at it. If it's not important, we'll just leave it. So one thing is having structure so that we don't indulge too much in it, get too distracted. And second is just delay it for some time because when something comes up immediately at that time there is the excitement of newness over there oh what is this let me find out so at that time it is a little difficult to analytically process it but if you just defer it then it becomes easier to evaluate it more objectively okay. thank you so let's move to the last point now what is the last point nature of krishna yes so now, <clears throat> Krishna also has his gravity pull. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, if we don't have bhakti, we don't feel much of that gravity pull. We may go towards Krishna and say so somebody who doesn't have any faith in deity worship, somebody just thinks this is just a stone image. They may go in front of the deities and ask, why do these people spend so much 
time and energy and money on decorating dolls. They may feel no devotion at all. But somebody who has bhakti, somebody who has shraddha and bhakti, faith and devotion, when they go in front of the deities, oh, Krishna is so beautiful, this is my Lord, let me pray to him, let me glorify him. So Krishna also has a gravity pull, but we may or may not feel that gravity pull. <laughs> now, one thing is that Krishna is always with us. Whether we feel his presence or not, whether we feel attraction for him or not, he is always with us. And Krishna wants us to change ourselves for the better. So in this battle to change ourselves, our mind may discourage us, the objects may pull us, the life may put us in dis uh, discomfort again and again. But Krishna is always with us. Krishna wants us to win this. Krishna wants us to succeed. He is Surudam. Sarva Bhautana is the well-wisher of all living beings. And to the extent we connect with Krishna. See, Krishna is, Krishna has, Krishna's mercy is reciprocal, but it is not necessarily proportional. Reciprocal means that when we do something, what has happened? So this is not reciprocal now. <laughs> this is disproportional. <laughs> okay. So was it coming? Okay. No. Hmm. So Krishna is reciprocal. That means although Krishna is omnipotent and Krishna is all attractive, but Krishna doesn't intervene forcefully in our life. Krishna wants to see whether we want to change. Now, Krishna is reciprocal in that sense that when we show him by our actions that we do want to change, then Krishna will reciprocate. But otherwise, Krishna says, if you don't want me to interfere with your life, I will not. I, will not. I won't force myself on you. However, when Krishna reciprocates, Krishna is reciprocal, but he is not necessarily proportional. One way we say it is that we take one step towards God and what happens? He takes 10 steps, maybe 100 steps, takes so many steps towards us. Of course, sometimes it may appear to us we are taking 100 steps and Krishna is not taking one step. We feel, I am doing so much, Krishna is not doing anything. But it's that's why now Krishna is doing, often he is doing his own way. But what happens is, it's reciprocal but it's not always proportional. It's not that say, Somebody else chanted 16 rounds and they feel so peaceful. I chanted 16 rounds and I'm still feeling so agitated. I'm feeling so bored, empty. So it's it's Krishna is not Krishna doesn't Krishna's mercy doesn't function in a mathematical way. It's a personal relationship. So that's why sometimes we may not sense it. But Krishna is always with us and he's always for us. He's with us inside us. And he is not there to catch us when we are doing wrong. Hey, I caught you. Did this wrong? Now we will get this punishment for this. Krishna is not there to catch us when we do wrong. Krishna is there to catch us when we fall. To lift us up. To shelter us. So Krishna is present inside not as a cop. He is present inside as a coach. A cop is there to hey, you caught it. Now I will give you this fine. Now I give this ticket. Suppose say we are learning driving. At that time, if we just in the early days and we go over the speed limit or we go on the wrong side, the cop will catch us. The cop will penalize us. But if there is somebody coaching us in driving, then that coach, hey, no, don't do like this. Both the purpose is the same, but the process is very different. So Krishna is not like a cop, he is like a coach. And as a coach, he is there to help us. Now, we, for us, the most important thing is to try to put ourselves in the gravity pull of Krishna. We can't suddenly change the gravity pull of the objects that we are experiencing. That's where past behavior that happened is going to come. We can't even change the 
the discomforts that life will send our way they will keep coming hmm? we can't even change the mind is repeatedly distracting and discouraging uh, behave nature but what we can do is put ourselves in krishna's gravity pull that means that try to do things which connect us with krishna now we of course have standard practices of bhakti like chanting associating and worshiping these are important but within these also we try to find out something which specifically attracts us towards krishna for some of us it might be kirtan for some of us it might be just words or ideas recite some verses for some of us it might just be you know going in front of the looking at the picture of the deities and praying to them for some of us it might be hearing some classes of some some but not just classes but some classes of some particular devotee for some of us it might be maybe making some dresses for the deities whatever it is so what we are trying to do over here is that we try to find out what particular activity takes us towards krishna naturally krishna is all attractive but we may not find him all attractive right now but we may find some manifestation of krishna attractive so we find that and we develop that when we develop that i'll conclude now with how this can help us to deal with all three see when we get discomfort at that time it's not easy to tolerate it and we will gravitate so this discomfort is coming from here and we'll gravitate towards the the unwanted behavior so now if we regularly as a discipline do something that connects us with krishna then that can become our way to deal with discomfort so if i just feel bored i feel lonely i feel frustrated then just maybe pick up a harmonium and start playing some kirtan just start hearing something and not just something by someone just hear something which specific nourishes us by that we develop a healthier way to deal with the discomfort so the discomfort is there but instead of an unhealthy reaction we have a healthy response to it and we have to find out what the particular healthy response will be for us secondly now the gravity pull of the object that is there whichever particular behavior or action that we are doing then we can't change it immediately but still if we practice bhakti the practice of bhakti is such that it purifies us now purification means that the impure starts seeming impure to us see as long as we are impure as long as we are impure the impure doesn't seem impure for a alcoholic alcohol doesn't seem bad but for somebody who is sober they understand alcohol is alcohol is bad so when we start get practicing bhakti because krishna is all pure we start getting purified and purification means it's not necessarily intellectual analysis this is bad for me that in by intellectual analysis is good we need that but as we become purified even with an without an intellectual analysis this i don't want to do this say some of us might have been eating meat in the past and we might have been attracted to meat in the past but now if you practice bhakti for some time initially it might have been difficult oh, how can i how can i live without meat but now say if you are traveling in a train or a plane and somebody next to us is eating meat we may not even feel at all tempted by it so what has happened it's purification so purification means that the gravity pull itself disappears so so right now what happens is that if we just see okay i am here and this object is here this behavior is how can i give it up so if we just look at ourselves and that object that object's gravity pull will seem irresistible but when you practice krishna bhakti that that object's gravity pull itself will decrease so rather than trying to resist the gravity pull we do have to do that but rather than focusing our energy on that we focus our energy on connecting with krishna 
and that connection with krishna will purify so that the gravity pull will not push us so much and not only that even the mind the mind itself gradually starts experiencing the mind that that krishna is nice krishna is enjoyable krishna is relishable the mind has been going for so long in the past seeking pleasure here there there everywhere and the mind has already experienced that actually things don't give all that much pleasure so what happens the mind has developed a habitual restlessness that's why many times when people are say watching some uh, say we surfing on the night net say if they're watching one youtube video they're watching it and they're also looking what are the related videos because they already know you know okay yeah, this will get over and it's not going to be that enjoyable maybe there's something more more enjoyable so our mind is on a perpetual restless mode with this next with this next with this next with this next so because of that perpetual restless mode even when it comes to krishna and actually krishna consciousness is nice but it comes to krishna okay do it a little bit what's next now this goes to something else but if we just keep connecting ourselves with krishna gradually the mind also start hey this is good why do we need to go so that transformation of the mind when it happens then the inner struggle goes down substantially that's when krishna says the mind becomes our friend prashantavana samvyenam yoginam sukham uttamam upaiti shant rajasam brahma bhutam kalmasham the mind becomes peaceful the rajas that is agitating the mind that goes down and then we become joyful sukhamatyantikam yattat ultimate happiness we start experiencing so that will happen by the process of krishna bhakti so krishna bhakti is not just about some rituals we go in a temple and hear some katha or do some puja yes all that is there but there is a there is a profound power over there for transforming ourselves and if whatever little will power we have whatever little determination we have is so trying to combat the unbehavior unwanted behavior we concentrate that energy on connecting ourselves with krishna on committing ourselves to connect uh, to connect with krishna when we do that that will automatically have the effect of weakening the unwanted behavior and even if that unwanted behavior doesn't weaken still we stay connected with krishna because for some people that gravity pull might be very strong and it may take a long time for somebody they might just be able to give it up in one day but for some people it may take months or years that doesn't mean that bhakti is not working for them bhakti is working so if we just focus our energy on connecting ourselves with krishna then krishna will actually propel us in transforming ourselves and by his grace what may seem impossible now will become gradually possible and eventually it will become not only possible but it will even become relishable cause okay giving this up is difficult after some time not only give it up why was i ever, why was i ever doing that my life is free now it's so joyful so that's how krishna bhakti will dramatically transform us so by knowing the nature of krishna the nature of krishna is that he is always with us he is always for us and he is capable of bringing about transformations that we ourselves can't he can give us a healthier response to discomfort he can decrease the gravity pull of the worldly objects he can change the mind's complaining discouraging nature so instead of trying to fight each of these battles separately we focus on fighting to connect ourselves with krishna and then he will fight all these battles for us or he will empower us to fight these battles for us and then for us in success in that journey of inner transformation will become eminently achievable and relishable so thank you very much i'll quickly summarize so i spoke today on the topic of how by transforming ourselves is so difficult and how bhakti helps us to do so 
I talked about four main points. What are the first point? Nature of the world. The world keeps making us uncomfortable. And if we are not comfortable with being uncomfortable, then we go towards damaging responses. So most people who fall to bad habits, it's often because they just can't bear discomfort. And today's world which makes us feel that everybody is happy, makes us think that discomfort is unnatural. And that's why we rush towards unwanted responses. And so if we learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, then we will not rush toward that responses. Second was nature of the sense objects. That they exert a gravity pull on us. And depending on how much we have indulged in the past, they may exert a far stronger gravity pull. So rather than condemning somebody because they are succumbing or condemning ourselves because we are succumbing, we understand that there is this gravity pull and that may be variable. So we uh, have to create support for ourselves to protect ourselves. So to understand what, where the gravity pull is the most for us, we can look at what we do when we have nothing to do. This can make us more empathic and understanding, kind to ourselves. Third was nature of the mind the mind makes discomfort seem unbearable it is like a chronic complainer and the mind makes indulgence seem so easy the mind has selective memory by which it forgets say it remembers the high of drinking but it forgets uh, the pain of the hangover so that selective memory is dangerous and the mind is a discourager it says you will not be able to do it and then it says, see, I told you you couldn't do it. So we need to turn away from the mind. One way to do it is to attribute our every thought first to the mind. Oh, this is unbearable. The mind is saying this is unbearable. And the last point was the nature of Krishna. So Krishna is with us and for us. And Krishna, he is, he wants, he is reciprocal, but he's not always proportional. And reciprocal means he will help us if we show him by our actions that we want help. And what we do is, we find out how we can place ourselves in Krishna's gravity pool. Find out something in Krishna Bhakti by which we can connect with him. And by that, three things will happen. That can become the healthy way for us to deal with discomfort. Uh, if we do it habitually, then instead of gravitating towards the unwanted behavior, we move towards Krishna. And secondly, as Krishna purifies us, the gravity pull of the sense objects themselves will decrease. And then as we stay connected with Krishna and the mind also experiences Krishna as joyful, and the mind's perpetual restlessness mode will shut down. And then the mind uh, will start helping us in focusing on Krishna. And in this way, when the mind becomes our friend, then what seemed impossible? If we try to fight all these three battles, tolerate the discomfort ourselves, resist the sense objects ourselves, you know, silence the mind ourselves, this will be very difficult. But if we just concentrate our energy on connecting with Krishna, then Krishna will empower us to fight these battles. And that which seemed impossible, will become not only possible, but even relishable. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, do we have time for questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Anyone who has not asked till now? Okay, everybody has to go. We'll start.
Can you give an example? Sometimes we may do we need downtime, but during that downtime we may do some things which uh, which may waste our time also, which may not be positively constructive. That's why it's good to plan out what could be a healthy downtime. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's a it, again it depends on person to person. So if somebody was say was hooked to reading news in the past, for them they read what they might spend hours and hours reading it but somebody in the past also was not so interested in politics or sports or this or that and they may read for a few minutes and move on so we have to find out where we are vulnerable and avoid doing that as a relaxing activity it may not be a harmful activity but it may take us too much of our time and if something stimulates us then doing that can be can rejuvenate us so it requires self-observation there is no standard list that this is what you should do and this is what you should not do we can also classify it as i broadly talk about devotional activities but we can also classify material activities in sattva rajas and tamas so suppose somebody just says i'll go for a go for a walk maybe a brisk walk or a jog so now that is you could say in sattva that might be healthy and that might be relaxes also so each of us has to find out what is a what is some activity that works for us and it will vary from person to person and if it is not directly a devotional activity it can be if it is sattvic activity it is more not in rajas or tamas sattva that is also good so yukta ahara vihara says krishna says do it in regulation okay thank you yes for our loved ones who do not believe in krishna then they are trying to do all the three things on their own which they cannot do at all so we see them suffering but what do we do to help them hmm so if somebody doesn't believe in krishna and doesn't want to connect with krishna then how can we help them deal with these three things yes it's a challenge now at least understanding how things are happening and explaining it in an objective way can equip them it may not be the best equipment but it's some equipment so there are many people who may transform themselves even without necessarily becoming devotional there are de addiction programs now many people relapse but some people do change so now i was talking with a de addiction expert he said that in when i was in that seminar that conference so he said that just by being with a person for about some time you know few hours i can make out whether this person is going to succeed or not so i asked him how do you do that So I look at the, I sense the overall vibrations, and in 90 percent I am successful. My predictions are successful. Who is going to succeed? Who is not going to succeed? But still, we try to offer support to everyone. So now, in these kind of programs, they often have to be secular because it's government funded and stuff like that. Of course, sometimes they, uh, if the person person chooses according to their faith, it's okay. But the but the doctor cannot prescribe anything. So the point is that even if we can get people to sattva. that to the mode of goodness that also helps mm. that that may not help. so there is pacification of the mind and there is purification of the mind purification happens by bhakti but pacification can happen just by sattva also just the mind becomes a little clear mind becomes a little calm so there is meditation just deep breathing mm. that can just calm the mind down 
so in general if this whole this three point analytical structure we explain to them and then help them see okay this is the discomfort you are experiencing and you find out some healthier way to respond to discomfort maybe they might like to read some maybe just read some not necessarily spiritual books but some good books they might like to listen to some good music so instead of taking their substance when you are having drug when you are feeling discomfort try to do this so we can try to give them a way to cope with discomfort that is healthier and acceptable for them similarly when we understand that the gravity pull is strong for them then it is better that we help them or at least help them understand that you need obstacles what do you mean who says who needs obstacles you know we want to remove obstacles but for us if we are indulge if we are habitual to indulging in something then obstacles deter us say so somebody is an alcoholic and their house is right next to a bar then it's almost impossible for them to actually ever give up alcohol they may have to take a house far away from the bar then oh i have to drive 10 minutes to get to the bar now during that 10 minutes as they they will make it into the car and start driving also it is the 10 minutes it's not worth it that intelligence may come back so when the urges come when the gravity pull comes the gravity pull of the objects is not constant constantly that high it may be there is constantly but it's not, its intensity is not the same always for a few moments it comes very strong and if at that moment somehow we can resist it then it decreases after so if we can help them create some obstacles help them understand this is you have this gravity pull and you try to create what obstacle could it be say if somebody has a tendency to surf on the net too much then maybe have some net filters maybe have some time plan that you now you will not keep your have some program with a password with someone else that you you cannot surf on the net for more than 2 hours or whatever based on one hour or whatever so then help them help them to see that when what happens for many people they feel as if it is their character flaw you think i don't have enough will power and they often take it as a as a insult you know you think i can't do it it's not a matter of you can't or i can't it's a matter of for you this gravity pull is there so if we help them see it in a non judgmental way it's rather than thinking of that person as uh, they may think as willless it is not they are not they are not willless they are weaponless this they don't have a weapon if the gravity is pulling you down what can what can will power do you just get pulled down so if this uh, phone is not to fall down it has to have some support so we help them create some obstacle so uh, that's the second thing and third is if they can have somebody whom they closely trust who can counter the mind's negativity when the mind starts saying you can't give it up you can't give it up they need that you can talk with someone else this in addiction terminology they call it the accountability partner hmm? accountability partner means that somebody to whom you are accountable it's best if you can contact them when you get the urge to do particular thing just contact them may call them or message them or whatever and they try as much as possible to be available and it's a few words also talking with them hearing them speak something some encouragement some inspiration some caution that can that can protect us but even if they indulge and the accountability partner has to be non judgmental non condemning basically okay this happened i understand they help at least needing to admit to that person that oh i did i did this that itself okay you know i'll feel so bad this person will feel bad about me it's not worth it so i feel this third factor if somebody can have that much trust they have even one person whom they can trust that much that can be a big big factor but often the problem is that people don't admit that they have a problem and people don't trust the other person so much so then uh we have to slowly earn their trust so maybe helping them just okay you don't want to talk with someone else but what are the negativity that your mind speaks and how you could counter them 
that same thing one way to deal with it is that whatever negativity our mind tells us if somebody else were telling it to us you know if somebody is having that issue and they come to you and they tell you you know okay i am not able to give this up see all of us are expert advisors <laughs> when it is meant to give advice to others and it is not that uh, it's foolish advice it's sensible also you know do this don't do this you can do this so we use that for ourselves that means okay if you felt i will never be able to give this up or you see, mind is saying it's no big deal if somebody else came to you and said it's no big deal what would you tell them and then write that down so what would be the mind's uh, discouraging messages and our own countering encouraging messages just write them down the mind's misleading messages and our intelligence corrective messages the intelligence will not be able to remember and function at that time so we need to write it down so write it down now it need not be spiritual directly because if they are not interested in spirituality but just their own something which based on their own self confidence their own understanding of life so help them have those messages then that can help them to counter the mind also okay thank you hare krishna okay you had a question bro no you answer bro okay more than more than you. okay thank you hare yeah. krishna I'm yes like our mind has a tendency to you know keep pro- uh, procrastinating the thing like tomorrow mm-hmm. i will do it and again the same tomorrow will like it will never come again the same tomorrow so how can we channelize our mind to you know, keep focus on one particular uh, thing which we choose to do okay so the mind tends to procrastinate so how can we get the mind to do things mm-hmm. one there are many different ways and each mind is different so it's like one way to deal with the mind is to treat the mind like a child you know each parent has to find how to deal with their child and each parent has to find out their two three children each child is different also the same way to pacify one child will not work for the other child so we have to find out how it works for our child for our mind which is like our child but overall the it's it's good to think big but start small you can start small and will grow big so start small means uh, that if you want to do something positive just what is this i call it the sss simple small step that you can take so when we are able to do it then that gives us confidence i can do it so if somebody wants to exercise from tomorrow every day one hour i want to do a workout and one day we do one hour and then for one year we don't do anything after that <laughs> now one hour may be impossible uh, one hour may, may not be sustainable okay what can i do okay i can do one push up every day one push up what is that going to do no can you do one push up of course what is the big deal okay just do that now small simple step see for us for us to do anything we need confidence to do it and that confidence comes by seeing that we can do something so when we start with small simple step then big things also become possible instead of thinking i'll read the bhagavatam in one year i'll read one page of the bhagavatam every day If I can't read one page, I'll read one line. One line? What's the big thing? No, I'll just one line. I'll read. Now one line, anybody can read. You know? Even before sleeping on bed, you can just take it on your phone and read one line. What happens by that? We get a sense of success. So if we tie our sense of success to something which is difficult to do, then it becomes uh, almost uh, then we become more discouraged. But something which is really easy to do. then even if some of you are not able to do it one day we can make it up on the next day also so if you decide i am going to read one hour every day and three days i don't read fourth four day i have to read four hours forget it you not do it only so keep it simple and by that actually we can start doing it so procrastination happens when the mind makes us believe that this is very difficult to do this is too unpleasant this is too difficult so one way to chal- counter the mind's procrastinating tendencies is to give it something very simple to do. 
so when you give it something very simple to do then okay i can do it then that way as you start getting the taste for doing it we gradually do it more and more so there are some things which come in life with deadlines we just have to do them say like if our job our family responsibilities so just come with it we have to do it but there are many things in life which are important but they don't come with deadlines so then we have to create those deadlines So is it that if we over pamper the child, uh, then it becomes difficult? It depends. I wouldn't say this is pampering. See again, each child is different. See how it is. That is, if somebody is feeling discouraged, at that time they need encouragement. Mm -hmm. If they, they did something wrong and they're feeling discouraged about it, then they need encouragement to be able to do it. But if somebody is done something wrong and they don't even feel they've done anything wrong. Then they don't need encouragement. They need chastisement at that time. Now this is you made a mess of things. This could have become so much worse. So we have to sense not just what they have done, but what is the mood in which they they are done. So uh, when it's pampering is when somebody is doing something wrong. I don't think it's okay. It's okay. So they are not even feeling it is wrong. Then it becomes pampering. But if somebody is so at that time, some amount of chastisement is required. Lay down the law at that time. This is what you have to do. So there are times when firmness is also required. So I am broadly talking about situations where uh, we feel disheartened about doing something. So the mind procrastinates by uh, making us feel this is too difficult to do. Then we make it easy. And even when I say, say read read one page every day, Bhagwat, or one line every day, it's not that one line is all that we have to read. One line is a is a rock bottom and from there we can read more also so sometimes the mind needs chastisement sometimes the mind needs encouragement and depending on what is needed in a particular situation we need to provide that okay so thank you very much shila prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrinda ki tai gaur premanand thank you very much hey krishna